You know, I found out you cannot delete Cortana. And nor is there a way that I could find to remove it from the panel in tablet mode. Well, there are ways to stop it, but it, you have to basically nuke it, <laughs> which it's a is an interesting policy. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm generally going to be lazy and just write PDX plus Q GY equals zero. It takes less time. So I'm not going to write that of XY of XY every time. All right, so let's suppose. So this is our symbol for suppose. Have I written that enough times that we're okay? It's like a half dollar sign or a lazy dollar sign, I should say. All right, suppose there exists a function of x and y such that. H times P D X plus H times Q D Y equals zero is exact. Then we can solve it because we know how to solve exact. So the question is when does such a function exist that makes this exact? So using the uh, method from chapter nine, the exact. So the question is, how in the world do we actually go about finding that h? So it'd be really nice if it existed. How do we? Uh, how do we go about creating it? In my notes I have written down, it's not easy. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, if we had it, what properties would it have? Uh, what properties? Would it have? <clears throat> what? Oh, okay. I need to slide that, that over so I can fit parentheses in here. Okay, how do we test for exactness? So you take the opposite partial derivative of the variable that it's next to. So for the first function, we're going to take a, dy, a y derivative, and the second function, we're going to take an x derivative. So when the y derivative of hp equals the x derivative of h. So this was the exactness test that we did last section, right there. And let's go ahead and apply the y derivative and the x derivative. And I'll write it out like this, d, dx. Now these are both functions, so what rule do we have to use? Uh, the uh, product. Product rule. We're multiplying two functions together, either h and p or h and q. So we got a product rule. Now, it wouldn't be good to write h prime, so don't write this down, just watch me write it and then tell me why it's a bad idea. Why is that a bad idea? It's not incorrect. Because the there's a y derivative on one side and x on the other. So if I just write prime, it's a little ambiguous. <clears throat> it's basically what we're doing, except we're going to use a different notation. So we're going to write it as h, y, h sub y p plus h p sub y. So that's what the pro yeah, why derivative that's what the product rule looks like here in this notation. And that's a little bit strange. Or at least feels a little strange when I write it. So 
So any product rule questions on that notation? So go ahead and apply the product rule on the right side, but you're going to have little x's instead of little y's. Yes, yeah, I said X's and wrote Y, of course. I wrote down one X and one Y. So oh, it's even better. <laughs> okay. So this looks like fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to make some assumptions on H and see what that would lead to. The first one is we're going to suppose h depends only on y, and then we're going to suppose h only depends on x, and then we'll uh, suppose h depends on x times y. So there'll, be, there'll end up being three cases. So we're going to further suppose h depends only on y. What derivative, so if h does not depend on x, what derivative is 0? So h depends only on y. So h is not, or h is constant as far as x is concerned. Hx. So that means the x derivative of h will be 0. And then we write that h sub x equals 0. So that simplifies our line at the top of the screen just a tiny bit. One of those becomes 0. So our hx, that third term there is 0. So we have hyp plus hpy equals 0 plus hqx. And rewrite hy as dh over dh over dy dy p I'm just rewriting our derivative notation. So I am writing a partial derivative, curly d, and regular lowercase d on purpose in those spots. Uh, and I actually screwed up a little bit above. <clears throat> so before I go back and correct my mistake, why do I need, let's look at the first one. Why is it OK to write dh dy and not use partials? Because it's always in the problem. So we, all right, it's right there on the screen. Because h does not depend on x. So it's technically not a partial derivative. So technically, it's a regular derivative, even though you could write partial if you wanted to. Uh, p, however, p very well could depend on x and y. So I have to write partial derivative right there. And likewise, q depends on x and y. So if I want an x derivative, it's technically a partial derivative on q. Uh, where I messed up a little bit above, I made the assumption h depends only on y here, but anything above that doesn't use that assumption. So up here, these should be partial derivatives right here, not regular derivatives. So these should be the partial derivative notation like that, because those functions depend quite possibly on x and or y. So we didn't make any assumptions about them not depending on the other variable. So we'll just drop those partial derivative notation there. All right, what are we going to do next? 
we are going to solve for dh dy. We're, we're going to solve for y is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it very carefully. So we're going to solve for dh dy first. So subtract this the other side. So we have h. I don't know why I rewrote <coughs> those partial derivatives. So I'm going to write them back in lazy notation. And then divide by p. So from here, what can we do algebraically? Factor out the h. Factor out the h. And let's move the h to the left side, so we'll divide by h. 1 over h dh equals qx minus py over p dy. So now we have at least got the h's on one side with the dh. So we can integrate both sides. Integral, integral. LnH equals, I have no idea what this integral is, so we'll just leave it the way it is. And how do I solve for h? Yeah, ln inverse both sides, or e to this funky power. So h is going to be e to this antiderivative power. So you have to figure out, well, before you even do that, you have to find the partial derivatives, subtract them, divide by p, and then integrate that madness. So before you can even find that power, you have to do some partial derivatives first. <coughs> All right, so that's what h will be. If h depends only on y, it will look like this right here. So next we'll assume h depends only on x, and something similar will happen. So we'll zoom out. So next up, suppose h depends only on x. So what derivative of h will equal 0? That'll be h sub y. Well, it's not really a sub. h sub y will equal 0 now. So that means h y is 0. So I'm going to rewrite. So h y is 0. So we have hpy equals hxq plus hqx. So where did this come from? It came from what's at the top of the screen, except the first term right there was 0, because our partial, our hy derivative was 0. So I just rewrote the last, the other three terms, basically.
And we'll do basically the exact same process, except I want to find the, uh, basically solve for hx and then take an antiderivative. So we're going to go do that now. So subtract hqx the other side. hpy minus hqx equals, now it's dh dx q. So divide by q and h at the same time. Well, let's not skip too many steps. So we're going to divide by q. And then divide by h. And take an antiderivative now. So we get ln h. So h, regular h is the ln inverse or e to the antiderivative py minus qx over q dx. So I want to warn you about handwriting. This might look a little ambiguous depending on where your fraction lines up. So what you don't want to do is have your fraction start to look like this. And then just your integrals on the top without, and then you're going to divide it by Q. That's not what you want to do. You want to integrate that whole fraction. So be careful. All right, last up, we're going to suppose, suppose H depends now when I write depends on X, Y, I mean depends on X times Y. So we're going to let u equal x, y. What is the x derivative of u? y. And what is the y derivative of u? x. There we go. <coughs> so h depends only on x, y. So we can write h as a function of the product x, y. So that's basically h of u. So what in the world is hx now? <coughs> so it's h prime u times u prime, but of course we're taking partials, so I need to be less lazy about what prime really means. We're taking x derivatives here, so I'm going to erase that little partial symbol, or the prime symbol, I'm going to write small x's down there instead. So I'm going to write little x's like that. And of course this just comes from h prime u times u prime. That's where that came from. I'm just using a little sub x notation. And what is ux? ux is just y. So we're going to use that right here. So we have hx u times y. Or we can write the other order y times hx of u. And we'll do the same thing for HY. So do the same thing for the Y derivative H of U. It's really similar.
All right, so we did as much as we could here. Now we're going to bring down that original. Let's see. Probably went too far. I'm going to put a box around this because we've used it so many times. So I'm going to rewrite this. So what I just circled is what we're going to sub out for, right there. So the H1 and the HX. So we said our HY was X, HYU. times P plus HPY equals HX is Y HXU plus HQX. And what we're going to do now is get all the H primes on one side. Hmm. Ah, we do have a slight problem. It's with the notation. <coughs> So this h derivative right here, hx, it doesn't really make sense to write it like that, because it's a function really of one variable, so there's just one derivative for it. There's not really an x and a y separate derivative for it. It's just a function of u. So we're just going to write it as h prime of u, and then we'll do the same thing. It doesn't really make sense to have a y derivative of h of u. So that means this is just h prime of u, and the other one is h prime of u. So we're going to do algebra, and we're going to get all the h prime terms on one side, all the h terms on the other. So we're going to just trade places with a few terms. So we'll get all the h primes on the left. <coughs> so we have x, h prime, u, p, and actually, let's write, let's change the order, x, p, h prime, u. So I'm just putting the h prime at the end, minus y h prime u. Uh oh, oh, we lost a q. So it should be h prime y h prime u q. So y q h prime u. HPY. All right, now we're going to factor out H prime and H off the respective sides. So we have H prime U times XP minus YQ, not to be confused with PX. So this is a multiplication, not some weird partial derivative notation. And Q 
qx minus py. Now on the right side, it looks a little bit like I'm taking the function h and using qx minus py as the input, which is not what we're doing. So I'm going to explicitly write the h of u. So I don't think that the input is qx minus py. OK, let's get all the h's on one side and all the non-h's on the other. So let's divide by uh, h of u. So we're going to have 1 over h of u times h prime of u equals qx minus py divided by xp minus yq. So multiply both sides by du. All right, what to do now? Integrate. All right, what's the integral of the left side? ln of what? H of u. H of u. Oh, hold on, something went wrong. There should be a dh. Unfortunately, the antiderivative on the right side is just going to stay in this form. And finally, h of u equals Just eat all this stuff. So is that typical when it's a little leg? And will there usually be like So it looks like there's gonna be mixed X's, Y's and we have a du, antiderivative. So this should simplify down to a function of x times y, right here. So on the right side, this right here, this function, so there will definitely be x's and y's in it, but it should simplify to a function of x times y. which of course is you. So IE, in other words, there exists some, and they use capital F of U. Yes, I think sometimes people chose letters to be funny.
All right, so if you get this f of u function, then it's just the antiderivative, the u antiderivative of this function is the exponent right there. So then h of u will equal e to the integral f u d. Well, unfortunately, this is not the solution. Th these functions that we just wrote down, these h functions, that's what you multiply by to turn your equation into an exact one. So you still have to then solve it with the exact method that we had before. This was just how to find the h, so that when you multiplied it, you would get an exact equation. So I think this is, yeah, it's the last page of notes for this section. So multiply original ODE by H, then it will be exact. So let's review the three cases. Do first, second, third, the order that we wrote them. Depends on why only was the first one, yeah. Actually, let me just, I'll just copy down what's in here. The order we're going to write these in, this right here you could write as h of py minus qx. And you should be wondering, why would I want to turn the order around? So just think of that py minus qx over negative p. The order of the next one is py minus qx over q, so it's similar. And the third one, somewhere, is p, uh-oh, we're going to do the same thing here. So we'll reorder this the other way. So it's py minus qx, and then we'll change the order in the denominator also, so that they all have the same numerator. So this one, if we change the order, py minus qx divided by yq minus xp. So we're just going to change, basically multiply numerator denominator by negative 1 so that all three numerators are exist the same and just denominators change. Minus qx. All right, three cases. Case 1. Let f equal py minus qx over negative p. And if this is a function of y only, Case 2, we have py minus qx over q is a function of x only. And case 3, let f equal py minus qx over yq minus xp. And this is a function of u equals xy. <coughs> so 
So in any of the three cases, no matter what, then rho equals e to the integral of f. The integral is with respect to whatever function, whatever variable your f um, was of. So either y, x, or u, depending on which of these three. And And rho is the integrating factor factor making PDX plus Q DY equals zero. You're multiplying everything by rho. So I'm going to write the original ODE with a times rho outside. multiply by the integrating factor. So we're going to do two example problems from this section. y cubed plus xy squared plus y <coughs> dx plus x cubed plus x squared y plus x dy equals zero. So how do we get started on this? <clears throat> no matter what, we have to compute py minus qx. That's why we wrote the three cases down all with py minus qx. So I only had to do that one time. So no matter what, either way, find py minus qx first. So go ahead and do that step. So find py minus qx and simplify it down. Remember the first part is p, the second part is q. So take the y derivative of p, x derivative of q. partial derivative questions. So I think we go back to exactness, our test for exactness. So this should be familiar. We did px and qy last section for exactness. What did we get if your equation was exactness, if you had exactness? So you got that py equals qx. So what would you get if you subtracted py minus qx? If they were the same thing? Zero, zero. Zero. So if you're going about this and you get py minus qx is zero, you don't even need integrating factor. You're already exact. Uh, good news is if you kept going, what is the antiderivative of zero? 
Is that right? It seems right, yeah, a constant. So your integrating factor will be e to a constant, which is a constant. So your integrating factor will be multiplied by a constant, which doesn't really do anything at all. So if you keep going this direction, you'll get your integrating factor as some constant. And multiplying your equation by any constant is not really going to change it. Might make it look a little more simple, but it's not really going to change it at all. All right, so though d was exact, you would just get zero right here. All right, so we've got py minus qx. There's three things to try. First one, we'll divide up by, let's see. First one, we'll divide by negative p and see what we get. So we're going to try case one, divide by negative p and see what we get. is 3y squared minus 3x squared. The original p was y cubed plus xy squared plus y. Did you say negative p? Maybe. Yeah, probably did. Right, yep. So in case 2, is this a function of y only? No, I don't think there's a nice way to get those x's out of there, so that's not a function of y only. So that's case one. I'm going to try two, which is p y minus q x over regular q. Negative 3y squared, oh, no negative out front, just 3y squared minus 3x squared, divided by something that's not going to make it work, x cubed, x squared y plus x. All right, definitely not a function of x only. So last one, case three, this better work. PY minus QX over YQ minus XP. Now the third one takes a little extra effort because you gotta multiply some stuff and you gotta simplify the denominator. <coughs> All right, so I need to leave you here and go ahead and for homework, write this as a function of xy. It should work out if you're careful.